Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion on philanthropy and filmmaking featuring three very talented artists. My name is Susan McLaurie. I'll be moderating this discussion. I'm executive director of Shine Global, a nonprofit film production company that makes documentaries and digital series about vulnerable children and families. Um, I'm, we have a, I'm also the producer of a film called Virtually Free, which is screening at the festival. And I'm truly honored to moderate this discussion. So let's get started by meeting our panelists. Julie Winoker is a documentary writer, director, producer, and cinematographer whose films catalyze positive social change. She's executive director of Talking Eyes Media, a company which she founded several years ago with her husband, photojournalist Ed Kashi. Um, their work has been seen on PBS, on Nat Geo Online, uh, on MSNBC, and in written publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Jonathan Prince has had such an interesting career. I have to say, he began as an actor, uh, but has gone on to write, direct, produce, um, and really pretty much every conceivable job you could imagine in, in feature and, and uh, TV filmmaking and series, uh, including being a showrunner. Um, his series include American Dreams, the TV series based on Four Weddings and a Funeral, and American Soul. Recently, in addition to his own work, Jonathan created and now co-directs Filmco, a company that's dedicated to making movies that make a difference by bringing audiences from empathy to action. Catherine Hardwick is also a director, producer, writer, and um, uh, and really, I, initially, Catherine, I believe you said you were a production designer, and I was fascinated by that and how that informed your your later work as um, a, a director. Um, she's worked on dozens of feature films, TV series, and um, TV films, including Twilight and Thirteen. And she's currently working on a film called The Greatness and is partnering with Film Co. to amplify its to amplify its impact. Excuse me. So, Julie, I'm going to start with you. Since your earliest filmmaking, you've invariably made films that provide a platform for your subjects to tell their own stories in their own words without heavy reliance on experts or other talking heads to do so. Why is this so important in documentary filmmaking? Um, I mean, you know, ultimately we're, we're always talking about this notion that we want to give voice to the voiceless or a platform for people to actually be able to tell their own stories. And I, I think that that's been uh, an aspiration for many, many documentarians for a long time. Uh, I also feel though that we're in a moment where we have to deliver on that, uh, you know, at a, at a heightened level because historically we've all been going in as the sort of, you know, myself and my peers and this group included, we, we sort of step into stories that are about marginalized people more often than not. Uh, and we pretend, portend, not pretend, but portend to be able to understand their stories and translate them into a format that people can really uh, process, understand, and then hopefully be activated by. And I think we're we're at this really interesting moment, and you know, this is something, Susan, that you and I have spoken about, is that it, it's what we've been doing kind of isn't good enough. You know, there's a whole movement now to have much more diverse crews, much more diverse um, participation in the process of making these films, uh, which is something that I know has me very preoccupied. And certainly the film that I have in the film festival, which is The Sacrifice Zone, has been the most collaborative film I've ever made uh, in terms of really engaging with the subject to, ver to participate in, in the production of the film. And that's been really exciting and it's been a tremendous challenge and it's, it's kind of set the bar very high when you're telling a story that's not your own lived experience, you know, and to really bring on board people who have the lived experience 
who have a much greater say in how you tell their stories. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. um, so the sacrifice zone is the story of the intersection between industry and quality of life within a community that, that lives contig uh, contiguous to that, uh, that industrial zone. And in this case, it's uh, the Ironbound District of, in Newark, uh, whose citizens suffer disproportionately high rates of physical and cognitive problems, which are undoubtedly, <coughs> excuse me, are undoubtedly uh, a result of the environmental assault that they're, they're experiencing. You mentioned that you were struck by the paradox of what you called an invisible backyard could you explain to us what that means? And uh, was it this that compelled you to make this film? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, so, so the Ironbound District, I, you know, I'm sure there are people who are gonna see this who don't live locally, even though this is the Montclair Film Festival, you know, there are a lot of folks from other places. And um, so the Ironbound District is a district that anybody in the New York, New Jersey area has passed by through or over thousands of times. And I don't mean just, you know, by accident once or twice. This is a neighborhood that anybody in this region um, has had many points of contact. So it's the place where Newark Airport is. It's where we have the, uh, the Newark port, huge port. We have the largest incinerator on the East Coast there. We have a, the largest uh, sewage treatment plant there. We take a lot of New York City's garbage there. Uh, and it's a neighborhood that has about 10,000 trucks a day go through the neighborhood because of the port. And what struck me, uh, you know, is that I, I was born and raised in New Jersey. I live five miles away and I had no idea what was going on in that neighborhood. You know, I have been again, you know, over it, through it, past it thousands of times and never stopped to question what all of that industry and pollution meant for the people who live right there. And so I went, uh, I've been doing a lot of work in Newark over the last six years. I've been doing a project that is based at Rutgers Newark and it looks at immigration and identity. It's called Newest Americans. And as part of that, I've really immersed in many stories uh, in Newark. And I ended up going on what's called the toxic tour that's hosted by these activists in the neighborhood. And it just, it blew me away because I just realized that, you know, we have, uh, you know, this, you know, this, this sort of horrific landscape that we have all created through our actions, through our consumption, through our travel. We've created this monster and we are responsible for this monster. But if you don't live in it, it is sort of blissfully remote. And so, you know, it, it truly is. It's like, it's like your silent backyard. It's like, it's hard to imagine if that were in our neighborhood that we would allow that kind of toxicity to continue. And so when I saw what was going on in the neighborhood, you know, it struck me that, you know, I, I, it was as much my issue to deal with as the people who live on the ground. And it also struck me that it's something of a time bomb because of climate change, there is regular flooding there. When Sandy hit that neighborhood, toxic sludge ended up flowing down the streets of this neighborhood. And it wasn't just flooding, it was the flooding of all this industry. Uh, there's a Superfund site there. It's, it's the site of where they manufactured Agent Orange for the Vietnam War. It has still yet to be remediated properly. And so, you know, this is New York City, this is Jersey City, this is Newark, this is all of us are impacted by what is going on in this tiny little postage stamp of a neighborhood. And so for me, you know, as somebody who uses film as a means to, uh, you know, activate people, I felt that it was incumbent on me to take the story on and, and at least use the tools that I have to try to initiate some change. And you do it really beautifully. It's it's um, it's a very powerful, powerful short film. Um, when you and I spoke about this, we were talking about the uh, the central character, uh, Maria. Lo I, I, I hate to use the word character, but the subject of the film, Maria Lopez. 
who works at the Ironbound Community Corporation. Um, and she really seemed to me clearly to be the heart of that organization. Um, and you were you were talking about how at the same time it's how essential it is to earn the trust of of your subjects like Maria, but how hard it is. And you it, you know, and this is something that as documentary filmmakers we deal with all the time. We see this, we we we, we catch the idea of a story like Julie's talking about, and then you 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 know it sort of burrows a hole in your your consciousness, and you learn more and more about it, and you want to make a film to to expose it and hopefully to do some good, um, uh, and you go in with the best of intentions, but you know we go in as filmmakers to tell this story about subjects who they stay. We make the film, we leave, they stay, they, they continue living it. And so um, I know you take this very, very seriously, Julie. Um, having worked hard to make this film and to earn the trust of Maria and her, her fellow citizens, um, I know you want to honor that faith by making sure that this film makes as much of a difference as it can. So can you tell us a little bit about your immediate call to action for it, both uh, locally and nationally. Yeah, sure. And and I just want to um, actually digress a little bit because I, when I first met Maria and I said to her, "Listen, you know, I I uh, want to apply for a grant to make this film, and uh, I just you know I need your buy-in. I want to know if you're willing to do this." And she was completely distrustful. I mean, just totally. And folks in the neighborhood are used to outsiders coming in and making a lot of promises and then they don't deliver or academics come in to study something and they write a paper and then they never come back again. There's a whole lot of broken promises uh, in a neighborhood like this. And so um, I said to her, listen, Maria, you know, I understand like this is not my lived experience. I am, I am not, you know, I'm not fighting the fight on the ground with you, but you know, here's the deal. I'm going to do my best to get your story right. I'm going to step on mines along the way. And what I need for you to do is to tell me when I step on, on a mine, like, like when I fuck up, you got to tell me because I'll deal with that and we'll navigate together. But what I need is for you to understand, I'm going to do my best and you keep me in check and then we're going to be able to do this together. So anyway, as it's going on, she was a very reluctant uh, subject for a film. She really didn't uh, embrace being on camera and whatnot. And so the funny thing was at the end of the film, we finally, we do the film. She was thrilled with it. And she said, she looked at me and she said, you know, I got to tell you the only reason I said yes is because I never thought you were going to get that grant. <laughs> <laughs> So it paid off in the end. <laughs> you does know the dark world better than we realized. <laughs> right. You just get saying, what is this filmmaking thing? How do you do this? Why do you keep showing up? Don't you have enough already? Why, you, you, you know, you want to come home with me? I don't want you coming home with me. <laughs> so, so what's your hope for the outreach and, and the impact of right. locally and nationally? Um, so uh, just two weeks ago, Governor Murphy signed the most progressive legislation in the United States, uh, which is an environmental justice law, which keeps industrial polluters in check. And what it does is it says that in order to issue new permits or to approve repermitting, that the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection has to look at cumulative impact in a neighborhood. And the whole idea there is that we are constantly overburdening the same people with toxic pollution. And so what the law says is that we can't keep doing that, that you cannot approve permits in isolation. So you can't say to the incinerator, you're meeting the standards. Great. Go ahead. You're, you're, you have a permit to pollute this much. And then you do that with 200 other facilities. So what the new law says is you've got to take into account the cumulative impact of all of these permits before continuing to issue permits to pollute. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge victory. And it literally was 10, uh, 12 years in the making. Um, so our film, uh, just the trailer from the film was used to help support uh, that piece of legislation as it was moving its way through the Senate and the assembly at the state level. 
Uh, it's been used for town hall meetings. It's been used to put a face on what is this issue we're talking about. Uh, the next phase in, in all of this is that um, it's got to be implemented and there are a lot of details to be worked out in terms of how this thing actually has teeth, this law. And so the film will now be used to, again, educate and activate people to become engaged, to understand what's at stake and to make sure that we actually hold these polluters accountable. And, and honestly, it's holding all of us accountable because you know one, one thing that uh, one of the interview subjects had said is she said, if, if every county had to have its own incinerator, it's amazing how much better we would be at solving this problem. Mm -hmm. But if you only put the incinerators in the black and brown communities who don't have political voice, then this is what we end up with. And, and so that's now we'll be using the film to make sure that implementation happens with this law and also to inspire activists in other communities that resemble Newark to see that victory is at hand, it is possible, and that this is what community mobilization looks like. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. Really impressive. Jonathan. Mm -hmm. You, you have had a career as varied as any person on earth, I'm pretty sure. And you really made me laugh the other day when we were talking. And uh, so Jonathan has been everything from an actor to a, a game show con contestant to a showrunner. Uh, but most of your work, as I understand, has, has focused more on production. He said to me the other day, he said, I'm pretty sure if they were building the Tower of Babel right now, I could be the general contractor. <laughs> so, I've, I've always said that I'm, I'm, I can speak WGA, I can speak DGA, I can speak IA, I can speak SAG, and I'm never the best writer or director or producer in the room, but I can translate for those who are better than me to the others. Yeah. So what I was it's so fascinating looking, looking at your work, um, and so some of these shows that you've done have been seem to be uh, really purely entertainment driven whereas others uh, have uh, more of a historical um, uh, thrust and, and, uh, and, and really a social justice uh, uh, component as well. It, can you tell us about this? Is this kind of more by happenstance or these do, do works reflecting different points of view kind of occur sort of as a melange or does it reflect more of a progression in your own thinking and your own career? You know, I, I think, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me uh, in this group. It's so perfect that I'm bridging between you uh, and, and Julie on one side as documentarians and then um, yeah. now partner Catherine as a scripted storyteller. I'm so glad that I'm the amphibian who can do both. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it absolutely reflects my personal progression. You know, I, I, I think I'm a law school dropout, uh, proud of that, uh, much to my parents' dismay. And uh, it was because I didn't want to adjudicate. I wanted to tell stories, and um, but I wanted to make a living. Look, you know, you got to be honest about this stuff. Like, I, I didn't really like being a waiter that much. It was it paid the bills. You know, I didn't like those day jobs I had. So at the beginning, I was I was sort of telling stories that were sellable that I felt I could be the voice of. Whether it was a a movie I directed for Disney, which was like a summer camp movie just for fun, uh, and I wanted to do a fun movie. Uh, and as I began to come into the company of, of great storytellers, both on the documentary side and on the filmmaking and television side, I realized that the power that we have of storytellers, and I include great novelists and great nonfiction writers, we have this great power. Um, and, and I realized, oh, wow, this is an opportunity to use this tool to perhaps either tell the stories that I find or I create or those of others with some responsibility that said, if indeed we can use these tools for the greater good, we should. And, and now thanks to sort of streaming services, but also to the fact that actors seem to be interested in doing meaningful projects, that notion of sort of pro-social filmmaking has expanded. It, it's bigger than it used to be. What we used to call an indie film might now be a pro-social film, something with an agenda. So I think it, it reflects my own personal journey from like, not wanting to serve pizza to making a difference in the universe, you know? And your point is interesting that what we used to call indie films now could be uh, studio films as well. And I think of a film 
like uh, Queen of Cotway that came out a few years ago out of Disney. And uh, and I watched it, I thought, oh, that could have been a Shine film. That's that's so great. And how they, they took a real story and, you know, then told it as a, as a feature film. And, but uh, but the impact was so strong that actually has had an impact on us at Shine, making us think about well, what about trying to do what we've been doing through documentary, through through scripted films as well. So, Jonathan, within the last couple of years, I don't know exactly what date you started Film Co, but it's in the last two years or so. Yeah. Um, in addition to being so busy as a producer, you 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 talked about starting to think about more about the social justice aspects and 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 the power of films to tell stories and to create change. Um, and and you looked at what might be some of the obstacles to that. And um, and the result was you conceived of and then you created and now you co-direct Film Co. Could, could you tell us about that, about your, how you conceptualize this and what its mission statement is? Of course, um, thanks for asking. So Film Co, uh, philanthropic film company, so it's P-H-I-L-M. That we, I thought it was clever at the time, it now seems sort of, <laughs> um, but, uh, Film Co uh, was born out of the fact that I felt like I sort of lived in two different neighborhoods. So I lived in the neighborhood of storytellers who were telling compelling stories, adapting novels, adapting nonfiction, original scripts, um, adapting documentaries. You know, look at my friend Catherine's great work, but people were, were, were telling great stories. And that my wife and I would go see a movie. Do you remember movie theaters? We would go to a movie theater, but even now watching on television, at the immediate moment after the story was told, just as I, when I closed the book of a novel I love, I was feeling something. I was emotionally caught up in it, whether it's one of Julie's or your documentaries or Catherine's movies, or as I said, even a novel. Um, and I felt something about it. And then before I could do anything about it, uh, life happened. Had to go pay the babysitter, had to walk the dog. I uh, needed to get some uh, second helping of popcorn, like whatever that thing was. And the afterglow uh, began to dissipate so quickly that by the, a, a few hours later, instead of feeling rage against a social injustice, instead of feeling extreme empathy, what can I do? All I was feeling was rather good about the fact that about two hours ago, I felt really angry. And I congratulated myself. Look at me, I'm, I'm so empathetic. Aren't I a good guy? Uh, and that bothered me about my own experience. Um, I was raised in a big family, by the way, I have four sisters and I would share, we're, we're best of friends and I would share a lot of that with my sisters. And I realized that even civilians uh, felt that way. And at the same time, the other neighborhood I lived in were the nonprofits that I worked with. My own personal passion is public schools. I really I just think we have to fix the public schools, but um, I realized that the nonprofits I worked with were really good at moving people to action, but they were not as good at storytelling as professional sort of scripted, especially storytellers. And so storytellers could move the hearts and minds and nonprofits could move you to action, get you off the couch. And I, Film Co is born of the notion of, could you create a true double bottom line film company that would create great stories told by great storytellers, by the way, scripted and documentaries, we do both and partner them with the nonprofits at the jump from the very beginning, from the inception, so that they would help us get the story told right, that they could work with us to the family offices, uh, foundations and high net worth individuals who might be interested in that, who wanna be producers on a movie. And at the same time, at the very end of it, help us market the movie. So we're doing a four quadrant film with the World Wildlife Fund. When that movie's ready to go to market, they'll send an email to their eight, 10, 12 million members and say, Hey, today, when you open this email, and we know you will because you're a targeted group for us, all we ask of you is you click on this link, it'll take you to blank, you'll watch the film, and then become an ambassador for the film, and there'll be an activation, a call to action that's inbred. When I was doing television, I was very good at integrating for brands, tires, toothpaste, you know, whatever you call it. Why can't we integrate calls to action in the film itself rather than making it an add-on? So that's a, a long-winded explanation. I'm I'm prone to those uh, of why I'm <laughs> going what we do. Um, so I, I was struck when we spoke about um, how 
how collaborative your approach is and how, how you're pulling together all of these different stakeholders and um, and and you seem to really give each equal weight and you and you're you're very respectful towards each um, do you think that your experience as a creative has informed your goals for this company and if so how yeah that's it uh, um uh, television was where I grew up uh, as a writer and a producer and director and then I went to features and then I just started doing whatever uh, I could get. Uh, I, I often say that the story tells you the medium it should be in. Should this be a documentary? Should we adapt this documentary and make it a scripted film? Should it be at eight episodes for television? Like The story tells you what it is. So um, I grew up in television though which is an extremely collaborative medium. When you're in a writer's room at midnight with a bunch of stale Chinese food and M&Ms and you're looking for one joke to go home, you'll take the joke from anybody, whether it's a high paid writer or, or it's the young writer's assistant or, or God willing, you know, the, the janitor who comes to help us clean up because we made a horrible mess. Like you'll take the joke from anybody. And um, the other thing was, I always got to work with people who I always felt were better than me at their jobs. It's that, that metaphor about playing tennis, how you get better at tennis by playing with better tennis players. Um, and I, um, I think I was humbled early in my life in college when I realized, oh, there's a lot of smart people here. Uh, and I think um, the humility of being around people who are better than you at something helps you um, enable them. Enabling got a bad word along the way because of addiction. Enabling artists, enabling great storytellers, enabling people who need your help to get there. And that's where I think Film Co works. You know, we. We're, this project we're working with Catherine on came, a script came across the transom. That was a really good story and it needed a great director and, and producer, Catherine's producing, to help the script. Um, uh, we just optioned the rights to Edna O'Brien, the famed Irish novelist. We have the rights to her book, Girl, about the girls from Boko Haram. It's a beautiful fiction story. And we just brought on Abraham de Sissato, who did that lovely movie, Timbuktu. He's gonna direct that and again, he, he's the guy to tell the story. Um, same as in our documentary world, you know, we're doing a documentary with NASA about Project Artemis. Um, if, you, if you've done your Greek uh, uh, mythology, you know that Apollo had a twin sister named Artemis and Project Artemis is the next Apollo missions, which is to send a woman uh, to the moon and then to Mars. So we're doing, we're telling stories with people who have compelling stories. And I think that the real challenge for Filmco is and I, I, I look at myself every day and say, are we living up to our mission? Can we really make a difference with storytelling? For example, I look at really good movies that could have. I looked at missed opportunities I learned from them. So I look at a movie I loved, Hidden Figures. I loved that movie. And I felt something at the end of it. And I was emotional and I was cheering and I thought about the wrongs that were done to both women and women of color and it, it worked. But then, then what? You know, and, and I wish that someone had said, no, this is about teaching STEM to young women in communities of color, or this is about the importance of math and science, Robert. So I didn't have it. And again, great movie. The same is true of documentaries. There's work that you do and Julie does, like you bring me to a certain point and then I want you to deliver me. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a danger that people speak of in, in all of what we do, all, all of us in this little rectangle do, which is a preaching to the choir. And I always say, no, no, the choir is the, you have to preach to the choir because they'll become the ambassadors to the people who aren't even in the church. So if I belong, if I feel passionately about a subject because I'm a member of that nonprofit or I'm especially empathetic to that story, I'm the guy you want to call my brother-in-law who doesn't know anything about it and say, you gotta watch this doc yeah. just to get to change your life. Yeah. So I, I hope you have your permission. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. Catherine, um, I so enjoyed reading about you and, and, and the work that you've been doing. And uh, it's, it's truly impressive. Um, uh, you've done so many different feature films, TV films, series uh, over the years. And what, uh, what jumped out to me uh, was the fact that some of your projects, and I'd say a number of your projects, have really focused on teenagers and young adults. Um, and uh, and this is a this is of interest to me because those are the films that Shine makes also. So I've really kind of sensed a comrade in arms 
in you, and I was so so happy to meet you. Um, what is it about, let's say, adolescence? What is it about this age group that that um, draws you? Well, um, I think it's a time where anything you're finding yourself, you're becoming who you are as a person. You're exploring. Um, do I want to be an activist? Do I want to be an entertainer? Do I want to be a business person? The first time you get to kiss a boy or a girl, the first time you have the freedom to drink or to drive a car. So it's this time of great exploration in very high stakes and very dramatic. You know, everything is the most important day of my life. This is the biggest deal that could ever happen. You don't understand. Um, now, of course, I got drawn into this with the movie 13, which I wrote with a 13-year-old girl, Nikki Reed, who was 13 at the time. And I thought that was so interesting what Julie said, you know, how much can the person be part of their own storytelling, you know, telling their own story. And in this case, Nikki and I wrote the screenplay together. We acted out every scene, and then she's in the movie as one of the main characters. And she's there every day. And um, when you're talking about the landmines and saying, nope, you're going off, she was there. Evan Rachel Wood was there. No, you're you're not doing something authentic, or I wouldn't really say that. So it was a very fascinating experience. She was living it at the same time. And the other thing um, I believe all you guys you said too is that. Um, even after you finish the movie, the person is still living that life that we made the movie about. So that was <laughs> another fascinating experience. And then that movie took us to um, juvenile halls, to um, rehab centers, to, um, you know, classes, schoolroom, school classes, and all kinds of things, talking with young girls about their own issues that they were going through having its own impact in a way, not quite as direct as Jonathan's talking about now. So when, uh, when let me pick up on that. So when you, when you visited um, the girls in different, uh, different modalities like um, juvenile justice facilities, for example, was that with the finished film or did you go as you were making the film to, to, um, uh, gain material for the film or was well, that, that, that was with the finished film we were invited to go to different places and um all over the united states and even in other countries and talk to people a lot of times we would show the film and then we would have a discussion afterwards with a counselor with a therapist with a juvenile judge you know and question and answer and you know all the subjects that the uh, film brought up you know yes yeah. so professionals could dive in deeper or the girls we would do writing classes with the girls in juvie hall and stuff how would you uh, do us how would you write a scene with you and your mother you know see a scene from the film and then take that as you know cinema therapy <laughs> and then also oprah did a show uh, where she had 40 mothers and 40 daughters watch the movie and then two days later, they came. Most people came on the show, and they had a therapist up there, and people talked about what had happened after they saw the movies with their mother, you know, and their daughter together. Wow, that's th those must have all been very powerful experiences. Was was that part of a planned um, impact campaign that you had that way, or did did it just sort of evolve? Uh, well, part of it, um, you know, the original way that I wrote it, I did go visit the schools. I observed in the schools. I taught in the school where Nikki and her friends um, went. And then I also spent a lot of time with Nikki and her friends and her parents. So I was kind of absorbing everything. But we didn't know that, you know, the film would get made. I think kind of like what Julie said, we never even expected it to get made. <laughs> I'd never directed a film. Nikki had never acted in a film. So that was a surprise right off the bat. <laughs> and then to go to Sundance and then to go to festivals all over the world and then Fox Searchlight, they picked it up. And, uh, you know, amazing person, Megan uh, Colligan, she thought, this would be a way to help the word get out. And so she arranged many of those things as a marketing tool, I guess, you know, to get the word out. Yeah. But it wasn't planned as much. I think what Jonathan's doing is 
great, you know, planning it from the beginning. We could have partnered with people from the very beginning and that would have been great. Yeah. Well, that's actually was going to be my next question. So you are now working with Film Co. on your latest project, The Greatness. Can you tell us a little bit about the project and how you and Jonathan found each other and how you are working together at this point? Um, yeah, I think maybe we can make this a back and forth, Jonathan. You can. Oh yeah, okay. The conversation going, but please start us off, Catherine. How did well, you a wonderful mutual friend of ours who actually works with you now, Tamika Lamison, who I met at the academy. She reached out and said, Kevin, you might love this project. You might love this company. So just finding out about the company, everything Jonathan said, and you know, it really was kind of taking me back to my roots. That was what I really wanted to do. More movies like Thirteen, but it's very hard to get people to finance these projects and you know we don't usually we can't usually get a grant for a feature film because feature films are you know multi-million dollars and or maybe I just didn't know but um so I love the idea and and it is about well Jonathan you you could tell so we were uh lucky enough through uh Tamika who works with us to meet Catherine and this story does feel very much like a story Catherine can tell but it's cl close to my heart um, my wife is from central California which is uh it's like a part of California that isn't like California. It, it's a very red part of the state. Um, they suffer from um, different issues than we do, not, not, not limited to, but drought, agricultural issues, but also huge drug and gang issues in Central California, even greater than one might imagine. It's stories that haven't been told. It takes place in sort of part of that area, but also my mom for uh, 35 years was a teacher of the deaf in the LA County Public Schools. So mom's a teacher of deaf, and this is about three deaf boys uh, growing up in in sort of that, a little bit of that triangle of California who are also Latino boys who who are on the edge of, of, of some dangerous friends. Um, and their salvation is in football and they love the sport, uh, but there isn't much room on the football team for three deaf boys when the coach doesn't speak sign language and there's not much interaction. And there is a really unlikely hero uh, in the middle of this movie, the woman, this is all based on a true story, by the way, uh, uh, a woman who was the interpreter for the district, much like my mom's job, who probably knew not a lot and cared a lot about football, but could make a difference. Didn't like it. I think she didn't like it at all. <laughs> As Catherine worked very closely with the writer Jamal, and what we thought was a good movie, and it was a good movie, has become a grittier movie. Um, uh, very much more Catherine Hardwick movie. I think Catherine, you've done such a good job with Jamal in, in getting it to that place. And yet it's still a movie that has this, this interesting Caucasian woman at the heart of it. And these three Latino at risk boys who are also deaf. So it's multi, it's trilingual, right? There's Spanish and there's sign language and then there's English. And then this other language, I guess called football, but <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and Catherine, I, I love that you in the process, um, have, have taken your role both as a director and a producer to heart in, in, in watching your process with Jamal and for me just sitting back and flipping through pages and saying, oh, that's better. Oh, that's better. You know, it's just been, it's been a great process. We're, we're, we're so excited and COVID has been a strange time. You know, I, I miss production. I'd rather be on a set than anywhere else. I, I love it. I don't love writing and I don't love post-production as much as I love being on a set. I'm sure Julie, I, see you and Susan nodding as well. And we look forward to the to the sort of COVID safe shooting that we'll do with this movie because we think we're very close to the to the point of departure, right, Catherine? Yeah, very close. I'm doing one last call with Jamal right after this. <laughs> <laughs> well can you give us a couple of examples from your work together? Um, and Jonathan, maybe I would direct this question to you. So uh, you, you you have football, you have these three kids uh, who are deaf, you, um, you, you, you have them uh, wanting to be part of this team, being, being accepted, but, but struggling with that and needing the services of this interpreter. Who do you see this film appealing to and what, what do you see as the, um, uh, the specific outreach and impact uh, this film might have? We you know, it's not a traditional, it, it, it's a high school movie, mm -hmm. high school sports movie. The team, it's, it's called The Greatness because the team happened to have a good year. So that's good. It's not about a team that lost because they brought on these three deaf kids. That would be a bad story. <laughs> yes. 
It's got a great woman's role. I think it's about teachers. I think it's about public education and the access to things like interpreters for kids who have special needs. Remember, special needs goes way beyond deaf and hard of hearing. Um, it goes into other areas. And those areas are suffering in public education right now. You know, those kids are just, they're just not getting what they need. By the way, even harder for them through at home learning, even harder for them at home learning. Um, but I think that the the activation, I think the call to action has to do be, if this sounds self-serving, it's about our public schools. It's about public school funding toward those things. It's also about the opportunity that one person can make a difference. I look at Julie's documentaries, I look at yours. Um, I think that this notion that you can make a difference, that, that there can be a voice against what seems to be an overwhelmingly challenging problem. And I think movies, again, a movie I loved, I'll, I'll, but to simplify, the blind side is a simplification. One wealthy woman adopting a kid, yes, she made a difference in that young man's life. Yes, that's, was, I loved the book so much and, and really admired and loved the movie. But this is different. This is the notion when you finish watching Julie's doc about this, this specific place, this not in my backyard, New Jersey place. How, what about me? What can I do? And I think it's the same for teachers. And I think it's the same, Susan, for your docs. And I know, you know, when I watch Catherine's movies, Catherine, you're so gifted in creating the notion of empathy for your fictional characters. Um, and I think that's, we have to be able to go from empathy to action. Awareness is not enough. Empathy is not enough, not anymore, not in these last three and a half years that we've watched as the government is washing its hands of anything that, that we all care about. So uh, that I, I get off my soapbox and give it over to you. So, well, so in this case, you would be looking for possible stakeholders who would who would care about the, the, uh, the, these particular subjects, uh, who would, uh, uh, you're looking for funding sources, you're, for, you're looking for distribution outlets as well. Both ways. So we have a set, a group of independent funders who love the movie, love the script, and are thrilled to have Catherine on board who would independently fund the movie and make it, and then we could go sell it. At the same time, um, and again, I, I'm always transparent about such things, having Catherine on board as our director and producer makes certain end users say, wait a minute, what's the next Catherine Harvick? Oh, it's a very commercial film about football. Oh, so end users show up where they wouldn't have in the packaging process. Um, at the same time, stakeholders include not just public school, not just deaf ed, not just special ed, but actually football players. So we're out to two uh, Hall of Fame football players who have a lot of money, who might also be people who could do two things, help fund, but help get the message out. Because this is about um, athletics and is about the, the ability for athletics to help a young man or a young woman along. Yeah, it sounds very exciting. Catherine, do you want to add anything to what well, Donna just said? Um, everything you said was great. And then also it's about tolerance of, you know, the other kids in school not seeing these deaf kids as weird, not bullying them, not making fun of them, but learning to embrace them. And so you see that through um, one kid even, uh, you know, reads this beautiful poem. And, you know, that opens up the hearts of this girl that's like too cool for school. Like, what? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Robert Frost. I mean, there's all these kind of beautiful things that happen, um, many layers in the film where you see people starting to open their hearts to oh. these kids. It sounds like it's, it's, it's really moving you in the process too. Okay, so one final question. We have uh, just about 10 minutes left, so we'll just let this question take us out. Um, and I, my apologies to all of you because I didn't share this question with you ahead of time. I thought of this this morning, but but I, I, I don't think it will be problematic. I'm struck by by learning about all three of you that, that you share in common uh, probably many more things than this, but what I can see immediately is um, you all had extremely varied experience creatively. Um, you are all very comfortable collaborating and really see the, the, um, how essential collaborating is. And you all have a strong sense of social justice. How do you think that these qualities inform your vision for what film can do? 
Well, I think every, uh, as I'm working with uh, Jamal, the writer on this film, you know, every moment you're just thinking, um, you know, he wrote this beautiful script, but the, the women, let's just be honest, uh, the girls in it were kind of minor. So like, how can we layer and give, give each person more depth and more soulfulness so that the girl isn't just cute, but she's also got, you know, more going on in her life, make her more inspiring to other girls because she is a poet or she's a writer. Just adding depth to every character as much as we can, you know, creating humanity, you know, like enriching the humanity of each character. That's something that we can do in the scripts uh, stage and then even in casting, in casting diverse looking people, diverse, you know, characters in everything we can. So, I, and I love the casting process because you learn so much from the young actors too, from the teenagers tell you so much that you don't know because <laughs> they're living it every day. So I think those are part of the ways that, you know, you can try to get in there through collaboration and just deepen each character. I'm sorry, I was I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was gonna say that sounds like exactly what you're talking about working with Nikki um, and Evan Rachel Woods as, as well, but how they really enrich the characters through, through feeling so comfortable with you and sharing their experiences with you. So, and, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And Julie? Just to sort of build on that and um, you know, I, I feel like we're we're blessed because we get to do really interesting work and meet really interesting people and get to witness firsthand, you know, different realities, different lives. We get to sort of parachute into people's lives in a way that allows us to sort of for a short time experience and live other people's lives, you know. Um, and I, I feel like for me, you know, I, I, I'm so clear that I have a driving force that makes me feel like I was put on this earth to do something that would make it a bit better than I found it. And I say that with humility, you know, I, I think I'm old enough now to realize that it is just a tiny little chisel in, you know, in this big sculpture that's being made. Um, but I'm really clear that I, you know, I'm driven by a sense of purpose. And so, you know, I feel like it just happens to be that this is my superpower is, you know, storytelling and figuring out how to kind of communicate what issues I see that are burning, pressing, you know, that I bear witness to. And so I think that when you have all of that in the driving force, then it, it, it shapes the stories you tell. And then, you know, I'm, I'm excited by this group and the emphasis of this conversation because it's not just about making the stories, it's about putting them to work in the world. And, you know, it used to be that it was good enough to create something and then broadcast it. And then you could say, oh, I succeeded, it got broadcast. And I feel in, you know, in, in you know, the depths of, of my drive that that was never good enough because it's not good enough to just watch something. It's, you know, that's half of the promise is that, you know, you got it seen and it's not good enough to just inform, you know, you have to activate, you have to catalyze, you have to mm -hmm. ignite, you know, so, so that's so much, it, you know, it's, it's all got to be brought to bear simultaneously, you know, so I'm excited, Jonathan, to hear, you know, that with your company, the way you framed, you know, your approach to all of this. Yeah. And make a movie with us. I would love to. <laughs> Shake. <laughs> I think um, the collaboration part is interesting because um, it used to be that in the world of filmmaking and, and television, it was the showrunner and filmmaking and documentaries was really the director. There was this sense of a central vision and one would move forward. And if you didn't have a vision, they wouldn't give you the money, you know, like what's the vision? and. And now I think the vision of a central filmmaker, even the voice, of, even the someone who is the right voice, meaning someone who doesn't need to ask the questions, Julie, that you ask or Catherine asked of the 13 year old girl, um, people are looking for a collaboration. So I'll give you two examples that come to mind. One is we optioned a book, I love this book by Bryn Greenwood called The Reckless Oath We Made uh, about a young man uh, who has autism and who believes that he's a knight errant 
uh, and he's out to save this Kansas woman who's a bit of a druggie and has some bigger problems. And it's just, it's a weird love story. And we talked to Bryn about who would be the right writer to adapt this story. And uh, after uh, two hours of conversation, I said, why don't you do it? Well, she says, I've never written a screenplay. And I said, well, having done it and done some bad ones, I can tell you some <laughs> So allowing novelists and not, um, we're doing, a, we're doing a, a documentary series with uh, the former Irish president, Mary Robinson, based on her book, Climate Justice. Um, we're working with BuzzFeed to bring those heroes to life. And again, this is the, she's busy. She was the president of Ireland. She got a lot to do. Um, and we said, be involved in this. So I think that kind of collaboration. And then I think multiple voices in the room to challenge yourself to make the project better. So we got the rights to a story. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of, I'll disrespect it a bit. It's another death by cop story another young black man who is killed in a traffic shop and i i didn't love the idea we were doing it i felt like we by the way we optioned it pre brianna taylor pre george floyd but like I, I was uncomfortable and our group film co got together and two women including tamika our friend uh, and another woman keisha both black women said this notion of who are you to make this story they did ask the question not just who are you jonathan white jewish producer but like who are we and why and in challenging that, we've made a different movie out of it. So um, I'll, I'll give you the pitch to end my part of this conversation. Uh, there's a, a movie company that's making this movie about this death by cop, and they've gone back to this town where it really happened in, in Connecticut to make the movie. And, and one third of the movie is the movie, but two thirds of the movie is the, is the other camera behind watching them make the movie, watching these well-intentioned Hollywood types come to this small town and stir up some five-year-old shit uh, and what happens to the town and what happens to the crew and whose mind is changed while they watch people interact sort of you know it's a it's a bit of state of maine uh, it's a little bit of borrowing from other films but this notion of well-meaning people and so the movie within the movie i forgot the name of that town but we're calling the movie white savior because it's that weird white savior complex and now we're making a scripted film it feels like a doc feels like a real movie, but it only happened because we listened to people who we were collaborating with who said, you have to be better. Good is not, you have to be better. I think that's a great note to end on, Jonathan. And uh, be, and I, I suspect that's what we all aspire to. We we want to make a difference. We, we, we cannot tell these stories by ourselves. We, uh, we have to keep faith with, with those whose stories we do tell and um, and take this one step at a time and try and make try and make things as, as much better as we possibly can. I want to thank you all so much, um, Julie Winoker, Jonathan Prince, Catherine Hardwick, for your insights and your generosity in sharing today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Thank Great. you. Great to meet everybody. <laughs> you too. You too.